Well, good morning, Southside. Welcome. Uh, any first-time guests, we are grateful to have you here with us, and, and I just love worshiping with visitors and getting to meet new people, so I'd love to meet you. This morning, we begin uh, Paul's closing matters in the book of Romans. I got butterflies. If, if you're visiting, this has been a four-year journey. We've gone up to the Mount Everest of revelation of God and his gospel, and we sat and we sang the doxology together, that everything is from him, through him, and to him, to God be the glory forever. Amen. And the question this morning is, what do we do with the glorious truth that we beheld in Romans? Do we sit on mountains and sing songs the rest of our lives? We, we come down with what we have seen to the ones that Paul said we're debtors to. I, I owe a debt to the Greeks and the barbarians and the Scythians. I, I'm, I'm a debtor to all mankind because God showed me grace when I was unworthy, undeserving, and not seeking it. I'm a debtor to everyone now to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we are to, to make the truth that has been taken up by our hearts known. What you saw on that mountaintop is to be proclaimed and told and modeled and shown in this world. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 15. This morning, Paul's going to bring us now really into God's methodology for what the church should be about. And, and I want you to get excited about this. This has been great for me as one of your pastors, but I, I think this could be a major reason why the church is losing so much power. There's a lot of reasons, but I think the gospel has become so me-focused, so me-centered, and, and I see people fall off the cliff on both sides. It is about you. The gospel saves. We've been studying it. It's a personal salvation that you need to, to proclaim and believe and repent for yourself. So drink it up. Paul wants you to understand the gospel, love it, rest in it, trust in it, it's so good. It's, be certain of it. Be confident in this gospel. But much of this epistle is that you are taken up into something big that God is doing in this world. You're brought into his kingdom. You're brought into his program. You're brought into his church to be a living stone in the temple that he's building and to live out Romans 12 through 15 that we've been studying. And I just think too many don't get that. But also, by not getting what we're looking at this morning, yes, by not getting what we're looking at this morning, um, we tend to dry up. We tend to dry up. This has been my journey in my own life and in, as a shepherd. When all you do is look at yourself and your own personal salvation all day long and it stops there, I just nothing happens. You just, you start to wither because you're so me-centered, me-focused. You're, you're just, you're going to dry up like a, a leaf that gets pulled off a tree. The most vibrant Christians I know are the ones that get what we're going to go over this morning, and it takes you up, like Paul in our passage this morning. I guess I'm, this is a cry to wake up. You remember back in Romans 13 where he said, wake up? I think we need to wake up to what do we do with that glorious truth that we saw on the top of that mountain? What do we do together with the gospel? 25-year anniversary is coming up in a month, and that's so important to me. I've spent 25 years trying to help you get Romans 1, 1 through Romans 15, 13. I want you to know the gospel, love it, live into it, be sanctified by it, have absolute certainty that you are going to glory by the grace of God, to look at his plan that he could save Jews and Gentiles and that we would offer up our bodies living sacrifices. I've been fighting for that for 25 years and to God be the glory. Some of you got that beautiful foundation, but it's, it's, it's not enough. We need Romans 15, 14 through 21. That's my next 25 years. But we have to get this. A church in mis mission is a church on mission. Paul's going to give us some great insight into his ministry that should be life-changing if the Spirit teaches our heart this morning from this passage. So I, I'm asking God that every one of you would be taken up into his mission and your, your life would just quit being about your little salvation. Okay? Your salvation's big but it's to bring as many with us 
as possible. And so let's go before our God and ask him to do, because your, your, your flesh doesn't want to do this. Isn't it easier to just learn a bunch of doctrine and sit in your living room and talk about it all night? I mean, that, that's easy. I never get persecuted. Well, from some of you when we talk about doctrine, but for the most part, there's not a lot of persecution. And so what I want to pray is that we learn that we take this out. God, awaken our hearts. Don't, think, don't let us think the gospel is just a set of truths that we're to believe. Lord, they're truths that have brought us into Jesus Christ and have joined us to you and have joined us to your kingdom, your plan, and your program. God, now we enter into a great commission. We enter in with this beautiful truth that we've seen in Romans to make it known. God, please wake us up. Anyone in here who just will not make this known, let this morning be an awakening for them. Wake them up. Do more than we could hope or believe in Southside Bible Church this morning. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, I want you to look at Paul's closing matters, then we will begin in verse 14. Here's your outline. Paul's going to give us three perspectives into his ministry. In verse 14, his his blessing, his blessing on the saints in Rome uh, of the grace that has been given to them. Then he's going to tell us where his boldness comes from. Uh, the thing we lack in not going out is our boldness. And Paul's going to tell us this boldness comes from the grace that he received. So he never looks at Paul and that gives him boldness. He looks at the grace of God and that's what gives him boldness. And then his boasting in verses 17 through 21 He's boasting in what grace does to advance the kingdom of God. So I pray that what we'll see this morning as we stare at the grace of God, we're dependent on Him and we look to Him alone, and that's what would lead us out and open our mouths. So let's look first at His blessing. Verse 14, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to admonish one another. So as Paul has been somewhat firm and strong in certain parts of this letter, he's now wanting to defend his boldness in writing, as well as make sure that the Romans kind of get the heart of Paul. He opens with his heart, and now he's closing with the heart of Paul. He's, He's preaching hard truths to them, and he's showing them, here's my heart for you, to not leave them despairing, And this is my prayer as we finish up Romans. I don't want to leave you despairing, but determined. There there are good things happening, Paul says, in Rome to be encouraged. And my prayer for Southside is that you were rebuked by some truth in our journey, that you were encouraged, especially in Romans 8, that your faith was strengthened and your obedience was purified, and that you would know my heart for you as one of your elders. True love preaches boldly. It will talk about wrath and condemnation that we spent a year while you were locked up during COVID. It will bathe its hearers in Jesus Christ again and again and again. It'll call you to not let sin reign in your mortal bodies and don't be conformed to this world. It will call you to love the brethren. It will call you to proclaim the glory of God and his electing grace, sovereignly choosing us. It will preach the whole counsel of God and not just what is culturally acceptable. But you can't just love the word and not the people that you preach to. It starts in my own heart and it starts in yours. I I love the people. And that's what Paul's going to open up. I've preached hard. I've told you tough things because I love you. And he's going to now let you see that that's the beautiful balance of Scripture. So verse 14, concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves, this is about as emphatic as you can get in the Greek language here. And it's so much so that it's almost awkward in the Greek and the English. And he's wanting to drive home, this is my own conviction about you, church at Rome. He has a confidence in their maturity. He longs to be with them, he said at the beginning of the letter, I want to be encouraged by your faith and you encouraged by mine. Their faith, he said, is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. 
He said, you're beloved of God, my brethren. There, there's no distance between them. I've heard so much about you, Paul's saying, from re reliable testimonies. <laughs> he says, I'm convinced. That's the same word when he said, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, all these things will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. I, I'm convinced of these things about you, Rome. On top of that, he puts it in the perfect tense, which says, I stand convinced Yes, as the whole world has heard of your faith, I join the chorus as well. I've heard of your faith. I stand, I'm convinced, church in Rome. Well, what are you convinced of, Paul? Three things. Three things. He says, first, you are full of goodness. And if you'll remember back to Romans 3, Paul said, there, there's none good. No, not even one. And the gospel begins when you realize you, you have no goodness. There's nothing you can do that will ever be good. You, you, you can't come to Jesus till you finally get that you're not good. You can't be good. There's no goodness in you. And Paul's now saying, wait, now the grace of God has acted on the church of Rome and you're full of goodness. So there, there's no one good. I rejoice that you're full of goodness and kindness and beneficence and uprightness, ethical excellence, moral goodness. This is the, the picture of what grace does in a life. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the innate goodness communicated by the Holy Spirit of God that works and acts and comes out. Paul says, I'm convinced, Rome, of your goodness. Ephesians 5, 9, the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. This was a church full of goodness. It had kindness with a hand to it, a lip, a foot, an arm, a wallet, They're just kindness to each other. Goodness found expression in tender love, much of it. Now they could grow, um, this is a bad phrase, they could be more gooder. You could get better. You could grow in your goodness. You're not perfect. But what I'm saying is you guys are full of goodness. It's coming. So this is a good question for us as a church to pause. And I think I can say with Paul, I'm convinced. Southside Bible Church, you're full of goodness. Uh, to the, the elders to watch the goodness that flows in a weekly basis from this congregation to God be the glory, but you're full of goodness. It is a joy for me to watch, to, to watch uh, my brother Mike, his, his kidney transplant is working, it's going, and one of my dearest brothers donates his kidney. Uh, just goodness, goodness, community groups, Watching what you guys are doing with each other has been beautiful. Memorial service we had here, the greeters, the admin, the AVL, the music, the food, the workers. Uh, I had someone just say, man, Tommy just made me want to serve. <laughs> Thank you. The cleanup, love, compassion. Greg Kurtz, I've known this guy 25, 20 some years at least, stands up and preaches the gospel. And I think that's the best gospel I've ever heard him preach, and it just went forth from everyone who stood up. The aroma of Jesus filled this place. Went to a wedding yesterday, and the glory of Christ filled this place. And our dear brother with one kidney after a week stands up and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to probably 400 people, and the aroma of Christ is just filling it. I have, a mom, I have a sweet mom pull up at my house to load 30 chairs into her van uh, for the wedding. <laughs> With her, she has a one-year-old. <laughs> Praise be to God. And so now this new church plant, what went on Saturday and getting that building ready and all that has gone in and support and prayer for, for, for uh, Lakewood to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just beautiful, abounding in goodness. I can go on and on. And I'm going to tell you, I, as we go in this passage, I know where it comes from. If it comes from you, it's going to dry up and be rotten fruit. If it comes from God, it just keeps abounding. And it just keeps abounding. To God be the glory. And so this was my prayer from day one, 25 years ago. I've seen churches with great doctrinal emphasis, and they are full of truth. But few are full of goodness. And I just prayed from the beginning that we would dig in this word as deep as we could, and it would fill us up with goodness. And so I give God glory and praise that you are filled. 
with goodness. And that moves to the second thing. They were filled with all knowledge. Why, why did you spend all this time writing this long letter? Some of you are like, we could have saved four years of Pastor Murphy. If we're already filled with all knowledge, why did you write this long letter? And so it's in the perfect passive participle. And, and this is exciting. It's a divine passive. And it means that you are filled by an outside source called God. So having been filled, this was that word we studied, epinosis, this full knowledge of knowing who God is in the gospel and the truths that we've been studying. Paul's saying, you guys are filled with it. You know this gospel in your head and in your heart. The knowledge of the gospel of grace, sound, practical understanding of the Christian faith that's issuing in transformed conduct. You'll never act like a Christian till you think like one. And so this church is great and genuine in their appreciation of the truth in Jesus Christ. And this is what we need, a resurgence of truth. And I'll tell you what, I've never been more excited about the state of Colorado since I've lived here. Like some of you are like, it's so blue. It's, you know, da-da-da-da-da. Man, every friend I have in ministry is just lit up for church planting right now. And they're planting and they're all working together and resources. And Colorado just has biblical, solid churches being planted all over the place. Smile, that's great. You look sad. James Montgomery Boyce, who passed away, was asked at a a faculty at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, What changes has he noticed in the seminary students in recent years? And I think this was back in the 90s, maybe 80s. (laughs) So it's even changed more. He said, here's what I've noticed. Each entering class was more biblically illiterate than the last. So every year, people are becoming more illiterate in the Bible. Second, each class seemed to be filled with more individuals who were swamped with their own personal problems and thus were thinking mostly about themselves rather than about their studies and how they could go help people. They're just more caught up in their own lives than they've ever been. Third, they had a greater sense of their own personal rights or entitlements. They expected everything to be done for them. (laughs) And that has grown in the last 30 years, I'll guarantee you. This this rights and entitlement. And then number four, they they were sold out to and mostly uncritical of the surrounding secular culture. So instead of being transformed by the renewing of your mind, not being conformed to this world, they were were being conformed to it. And those are the leaders of our church. I pray that we're filled with all knowledge and a commitment to learning the Word of God in everything that we do. And the reason then is that it would lead us to this third point, You're competent to instruct one another. And this this point is beautiful. You're able to admonish. This Greek word is nuthetain. And I'll explain that word in a second. But it means admonishing another person in order to correct something that might be wrong. Unrighteous correction, leading them in the right path. So they're on a false way, and you're trying to get them on on the true way, the narrow way. Way. So it means to reprove, rebuke, redirect, encourage, to warn. And so only a congregation full of truth and goodness will ever be able to do this right. So when you're filling, filling up with the brim, you can now help other people. You've got truth and you've you're got goodness, so you're not gnarly Charlie breaking up the body of Christ. You're entering in with love and agape, and you can actually guide and correct people. So this congregation in Rome has the capacity for providing for its own edification and mutual instruction. This sounds like Ephesians 4. So you have the ability among yourselves. You don't need an apostle. You don't need a pastor. You are able, church in Rome, to, to counsel competently one another and help each other. You don't need professionals. It's iron sharpening iron. Every member ministry competent to counsel, and we can work and help one another to grow. We can do nuthetic counseling with each other. The Greek word is nous, which means mind. Tithame, which means to put in place. It's a beautiful word. To, To put in place your mind back on truth, 
hope in God that we learned last week, to trust Him, to walk in righteousness. We, we, can, we can correct the mind and put it back in place. And the only ones who can do that are those who know truth and are overflowing with goodness. I was thinking back to Romans 1.28. Paul said, you have de depraved noose. You come in with a mind that's depraved and it, it can't think right. It, it looks at creation and suppresses it. It says, I want my sin. I don't want to worship God. Repentance is meta nueo, which there's our word. It's a change of mind. And grace changes your whole thinking about God, life, sin, and you change your mind and you turn to Jesus Christ. So your noose is changed. And then in Romans 12 too is the renewing of the noose. And so now we're taking truth in and we're growing how we think. And now he's saying you got a church that can come and help get your thinking back on when you, when you get off. And, and that's why we need each other. That's why we need the body of Christ because I'm prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. I start thinking and acting wrong and I need brothers and sisters to, to lead my noose back to right thinking about God. So to admonish is the exertion of influence upon the noose. And so we have a hangover in Adam that has a resistant mind to truth. So we need newthetic counseling. In Acts 20, 31, Paul said, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease, here's our word, to admonish each one with tears. I was newthetoing you constantly. Night and day with tears, pleading, truth, get back on the path, you're drifting, you're, you're soaking up the world, and, and I just kept preaching and begging and showing you. Our theme verse 25 years ago, Colossians 1.28, we proclaim Him, Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. We're, we're teaching the Word of God and we're newthetoing you to correct thinking and correct living. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the nutheo of the Lord. You're doing this with your children. You're to take their wrong thinking and to guide it to God's right thinking. And so we're nuthetic counselors, parents in our homes every day, trying to guide them into this path. And so Paul's just praising God that this church has nuthetic capacity to correct and encourage by the Spirit of God and the truth. And, and listen to this. The whole church, the whole church was able to do that. That's my prayer. We're all to be counselors, iron sharpening iron. We got to warn and rebuke one another. This body must grow up into this. <clears throat> and this is why Jared Hazlett has been working so hard in our discipleship ministry with Joel George and Nate Thompson. And our desire is to grow and help you and, and bring your minds back to truth and correcting wrong living, wrong thinking, wrong behavior. We're all working together. Your community groups, discipleship, every day, you've got to get into, if you learn anything from Romans 12 through 15, you've got to get into each other's lives. The, a Christian who lives outside the body, you've missed the whole thing of Romans. And so we get into each other's lives so that we can do this with each other. And I've said this before, the people I know who never dug into the body of Christ, they never grow. They're battling the same sins, one 50 years later, because they didn't engage in the body where we rub up against each other and hard things happen and we begin to nuthetic, nuthetic counsel one another. This is all of our callings. So Paul is blessed by this congregation and how beautiful it is when people who are full of goodness and knowledge admonish one another. That's what Romans should do to our lives. And I thank God because I do see that growing and abounding in our midst. That's his blessing. I've got to, I've got to pick up the pace. Let's go. His boldness then, and I want, you, I want everyone in here to become bold. I, I just want you to know, I, I was a, if you had to define me after I got saved, I was a scaredy cat. I just was afraid of people sharing the gospel. So afraid. How do you ever get boldness to proclaim and preach the gospel, okay? So Paul says, I've written very boldly. Uh, that's to say it's light, huh? I've written very boldly to you on some points. 
Why, Paul? Why, do, why would you do that? So as to remind you again, a good minister just keeps reminding of what you already know. You, Spurgeon said, stay on the old paths. Or, this generation, I want something new. I want a new philosophy. I want a new, just everything's new. And Paul says, get on those old paths and remind each other of those foundational truths. I have no new truth. One Bible, one God, one mediator, one hope. I want to be a broken record from different angles till I die. Peter said this, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth which is present in you. I think I've probably had 10,000 meetings on the gospel. I never get tired of reminding, repeating it. It just gets better <laughs> and sweeter. So rejoice, Southside. We want to bring you the truth and not round it off. And our, your elders desire to give you every part of God's word. And so this morning I come with boldness because your hearts are full of goodness, knowledge, and you admonish. So I come in love. I want you to be like Christ and awake from your sleepiness and awake you to the things of God. And so Paul wrote boldly. He said, grounded in the recognition of his calling. So let's dig in. How can I get bold? Paul says, I'm bold because I have been called by God to do this. Sometimes you think Paul is just kind of a gnarly guy and he just was bold. And he's saying, no. What made me bold is that God called me to this. And if God's for me, who could be against me? Every Sunday, I'd still get so nervous. I don't know why I can't get over it. And the only reason I get up every Sunday, I'm called by God, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to get boldness that you're called by God to take this gospel to wherever you are and wherever we go. Because Paul said, the grace that was given me from God. And that's not saving grace. That's back to Romans 1.5. He said, I've been given the grace of apostleship. So I've been given grace to perform what God is calling me to do as the apostle to the Gentiles. It's the calling of grace of God to be in ministry for Paul. So look at verse 16. He says, to be a minister of what? Of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. I have a divine calling and enablement from God. I have the authority and the right to talk boldly to you because I'm an ambassador for Christ. My, if it was my words, I have no right. But if I'm speaking in behalf of Jesus Christ, I have all authority uh, from him that's been given to him in heaven and on earth. This calling makes me bold. Paul said, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just called to preach to his Jewish nation, he was called to the nations. And I want you to catch this phrase lit me up this week. If you're falling asleep, you wake up now. This is beautiful. I'm going to be ministering as a priest the gospel of God, that my offering of the Gentiles might become acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul moves into this language now of the Old Testament. He's bringing us into the ceremonial system. And Paul's talking here in metaphorical links. And he's ransacking terms from the Old Testament, and he's applying them now figuratively to the calling that he had from Christ. It's just a beautiful picture. It's this fulfillment in the new covenant. And now he's saying, I'm ministering as a priest the gospel of God. This Romans, the gospel, I'm a, I'm a minister of that. And the priest would be one who performed a sacred service before God, the Levitical priesthood. And Paul thinks of one of those whose life was just consecrated and set apart to be a priest for God serving in the temple. And, and so I, I'm to be a priest to God, Paul says. And I'm set apart then. I'm consecrated to do what? He says to minister, ministering to render a sacred service to God. And the way I'm going to minister is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm appointed to a sacred and solemn task 
of preaching Jesus. I'm set apart to this holy task to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to get this. And so I don't make atonement, but I present the atoner to this world. I don't lay hands on a sacrifice. I call men and women and children to lay hold of the sacrifice once and for all. I don't spill out blood, but I show them a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. We are set apart for the gospel. Paul says, woe is me if I don't preach this gospel. This is what I've been called to. Well, my question, Paul, is if you're a priest, what is your offering? What are you going to offer? Well, it's not the blood of bulls and goats. Look at the passage. This, is, this, this really took me back. My offering is the Gentiles. I'm, I'm offering up the Gentiles. I don't want to come empty-handed to God. I want the redeemed souls from the nation. It's going, the gospel's now going to the nations. I, I want to come before God. Here's my offering, the nations. I want to offer up souls that have been washed in the blood of Jesus, but even more, our passage says that they might become acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Does that word acceptable jump out to anything that we've done in Romans that you can think of? So who said that? Yes. Romans 12.1. Therefore, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice that's acceptable and pleasing to God. It's holy. So what was something holy is in the temple, something common like a showbread or a table or a spoon. And, and you bring it into association with God and now it's holy. It's sanctified. It's set apart. It goes from common to holy when it's associated with God. And so these unclean dogs... Us, the Gentiles, are sanctified when you're joined to Jesus Christ by faith. And now we can make an acceptable offering to God, saying, here's my life. I don't bring anything either. I, I, I just bring my life. God, it's yours. Paul was a priest set apart to serve God by the gospel, by preaching it to the Gentiles, that some would believe and have the obedience of faith and that they would do a living sacrifice. I, I want to give God a bunch of saved Gentiles who are living their lives for God. You don't know what that does to me. <laughs> the sweet aroma of this sacrifice to God is holy men, women, and children laying their lives down to serve the living God. I'm hungry for that my own life, and in yours. That's what I want to offer up to God. That's why I chose Romans to do it again from 20 years ago is so that when we get to Romans 12.1, it would all connect that therefore, the whole foundation of the gospel, and that we would offer up our bodies living sacrifices. That's why I hate legalism, licentiousness, moralism. You want to get me upset? Preach those in our church. <laughs> because it, it, it hurts, it kills, it ruins, it, it takes away that offering that we want to give to God. And so we are we're, we're protective over the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we'll make offerings that are pure and holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. Elders, our lives are for this offering to God. Mateo and Ray. Where'd Ray go? I saw him here a second ago. Everyone has to use the bathroom. So <laughs> Mateo and Ray set apart for the gospel to see Gentiles in Lakewood come to Jesus Christ, to offer up their bodies to God, a living and holy sacrifice so God gets the glory. Never, never steer or veer away from that, my friend, and tell Ray about it. Yeah, Ray, it's beautiful. Go. I know Nick listens to these sermons. Nick, do not grow weary. <laughs> Where is the... Nick, do not grow weary in preaching the gospel in Tijuana to offer up Gentiles who obey and serve the living God. I, I pray the Holy Spirit will blow through North Africa to have a Muslim city 
offering up their bodies a living sacrifice to God. And I think of all the sacrifice and pain that that family's endured, and some of you sitting here this morning, what you had to endure as children. I pray that all that sacrifice would just be the Spirit blowing through there. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who's called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, Gentiles, but now you're the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's take that. So his blessing to the church at Rome, that's why Paul's bold. And now I want to know why is he boasting? In verses 17 through 21, he, he starts boasting. But I want you to notice he's boasting in what grace accomplishes through the gospel. And so Paul is sharing his heart, his calling, why he does what he does, his methodologies. And so come with me to verse 17. And so we, we, we have, therefore, because of this calling of God and your appointing, in Christ Jesus, Paul says, I found reason for boasting in the things pertaining to God. And we've been telling you throughout Romans, don't boast. Don't ever boast. And he's, he's boasting. But he says, I'm boasting of the things pertaining to God, I boast in the cross of Jesus Christ alone. What happened to this man? I want to read something to you, Philippians 3.3. For we're the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. We do not boast in us. Although Paul says, I could have confidence even in the flesh if anyone else has to, to put confidence in flesh. I was circumcised on the eighth day in the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. My boast was me. My confidence was me. My merit, my goodness, my law keeping. And on, on that road, I saw the glory of Jesus Christ. And when I saw that, he said, whatever things were gained to me, those things now I count as loss for the sake of Christ. All that flesh I thought was getting me acceptance with God, it was leading me away from Him. If you're sitting here trying to clean yourself up and be good enough, you're actually leading yourself away from God because He wants you to come now like Paul's going to come. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now all he can boast in is Jesus Christ. I'll, I'll gladly boast of Christ and all that He's doing through me. And so I pray that everybody gets that piece. That is so big. Look at verse 18. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed and in the power of signs and wonders and in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I fully preached the gospel of Christ. The only string on my banjo is Jesus. Through me, I'm an instrument no boasting in instruments. You ever seen a guy chop down a tree and just go, look, my axe. <laughs> the axe is like cocky. It's who's swinging it. There's no boasting in instruments. We boast in Christ. And I want you to get this. However God will use you the rest of your life, you will never boast in you. You're an instrument. But it's the grace of God. And I stand and say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And if we're going to follow what Paul's saying in this section, it's got to come from people who don't look to their gifts, their strengths, their resources. They just go letting the Spirit of God work through instruments. Where is boasting in Christ Jesus? And may no instruments in this church ever get glory. We saw this with our gifts back in Romans 12 and now with our ministry. It's all Christ Jesus so that God would be glorified. So Paul could boast in God calling him and using him. And he gives us three reasons 
how does a minister come? And I got to finish it up, so I'm just going to give you these briefly. He says, by word and deed, he, he comes by what he says and what he did, and he comes in the power of signs and wonders. Second Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, they're authenticating that he was from God, an apostle called by God, proclaiming God's message. And he says, and then I came in the power of the Spirit, the quickening work of the Holy Spirit, not in word only, but in power. Paul said to the Thessalonians, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So he comes with word and deed, power of signs and wonders, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And how will God use one like this? Listen to what Paul said. So that from Jerusalem and round about, as far as, if I can butcher this again, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I, I just want, let this take your breath away. Don't be familiar and let this miss. Christ has been made known to the Apostle Paul as that instrument from the bottom of Palestine to the top of Greece. He went on three missionary journeys. He's carried the gospel, listen to this, close to 1,500 miles on foot. And he's gone into the darkness with the light. And God in his grace has lit a torch in all these major cities that were trade centers where everyone would flow and go out from so the gospel impact would just go even further. And Paul says he fully preached. So no, Paul has not preached to every individual in these regions, but he established churches and he lit the torch and now those churches were to fan the flame and evangelism of Jesus Christ was to go out. And look with me in verse 20. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named that I might not build upon another man's foundation. So he took the gospel where Christ was not confessed, not worshipped, and he'd go into these uncharted areas and he desired to come to them in Rome and strengthen them on his way to Spain. Um, so Paul liked these images of buildings and foundations. He said, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. So Paul was saying, I, I go around laying foundations, planting churches. And then others would come and pastor these churches and build up the body of Christ and take the gospel light into those regions to be aflame. This is Paul's calling to go claim unclaimed ground for Jesus Christ. And now in this letter, I want to go to Spain. It's a beautiful place to go. Let's go to Spain and preach the gospel. And this is the reason for his method and why he did what he did. And then I'm just finishing up verse 21. I know this is a lot, but I got to get done before I go on vacation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. It's an Old Testament quote from Isaiah 52, and he's showing you this is the plan of God. The suffering and exaltation of Messiah in, in 52 and 53 of Isaiah, Christ is going to be crushed, and he says the nations will be sprinkled with his blood. We read it this morning. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Paul is saying, I'm part of this fulfillment of Isaiah. This is all according to plan. It's God's plan, it's his gospel, and it's Christ through me accomplishing all that the Father desires. All the way back to the promise that he made to Abraham that descendants would be as many as the sand on the seashores and the stars in the heavens, and that in that singular seed, the nations would be blessed. And Paul's saying, it's happening, it's happening. And we live in the ingathering of the nations. And so the fullness of the time has come, the gospels go into the nations. Paul's called to the gospel ministry to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He's a frontier missionary. He's going to be beaten with rods, 39 lashes, stoned, imprisoned, threatened, shipwrecked, dangers, sleepless nights, without food, etc., etc. He could not be silent. We, we can't open our mouths up. And Paul just couldn't shut up. He just kept preaching it wherever you put him in prison. That's his new prison ministry, wherever he goes. Why? 
because of what he saw on the Damascus Road, because of what we saw sitting on top of Mount Everest, seeing the gospel and the glories and the beauties of Christ. I can't shut up. Tradition says that he was finally beheaded. You know how you shut Paul up? You cut his head off. And now he still speaks because millions have been converted by the letter that he has written in, in, in Romans. And so you can't, even, you can't shut up. He's dead and he's still speaking today. Millions have come to Jesus Christ through these letters. I did a wedding with you two. You both got saved in Romans and that was their whole wedding. Paul's still speaking. I love it. Instrument. Instrument is what he was. Paul could boast. Look at what all he did. If anyone could have ever said, look at me, all he could say is, it's what God did by his grace through me. This guy wasn't even tempted to do this. This is what God does through his spirit and his message. And so as I close, we have to have a global strategy to be faithful. This, this is telling me what is our application from Romans. And everyone has to work at it. Every church needs to be filled with evangelists who take it and go out. And everyone, this is why we began the year with me training you in CTM, a call to mission. You need to go out and enter in to every place you go. Go to the same butcher every week. Don't, don't order your groceries and have them deliver them unless you're sick. Get, get out. Go. Neighbors, invite them over. Just, just get out with the gospel. Don't think that Romans ended at Romans 15, 13. And all it was is me to learn all these things and have Bible studies and talk about them. That isn't, that's beautiful, but that's so that you will get full of the gospel so you'll take it and go and it's on your heart and your mind. Uh, I think it was MacArthur one time said, we're, we're like the Hudson River. We're all frozen over at the mouth. Let, let Romans 1 through 15, just get the, all the frost and ice off your mouth. Just stare at Jesus and what he's done. Doesn't that make you want to speak? And tell people the glories of Christ. We need those who want to plant churches in areas that lack light. Every church needs those who can't rest until unreached peoples across the world hear the gospel. And I rejoice that we got several of those sitting here in this body doing that. We need that. And we need to all work together to get that out. And we need to be growing in all of these areas. This is the response to what we saw on the top of Mount Everest. That others would see the glory that we saw and worship. That's got to drive you out of your silence. They got to see the glory that we saw and believe in Christ and be saved. So we need Romans 15, 14 through 21 to abound more in this body and in this heart. I'm determined with all my heart to lead us in these things and these excellent things because this is the, the will of God. And honestly, this is where you grow the most is when you quit navel gazing and get out and start risking and telling people about Jesus and get persecuted and, and a little sweat, maybe a little blood. This is where you're gonna grow. I promise. I'm trying to bless you. You know what Paul said? I'm doing this because I wanna bless you. So pl please don't settle for a salvation that's just you and God. The end is near, we need to wake up and join our hands in mission to do whatever we can to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. That name is worthy to lift up at any cost. I want to go 1,500 miles, whatever it takes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Paul opening his heart up and giving us this picture. God, let this um, take away pride in any one of our hearts. It is, it is, we're instruments it's your spirit, it's your grace, it's your power that will do this work. God, I pray, humble us this morning and yet give us courage. Let us have boldness because it's you that does it through us. Thank you that you use weakness. Thank you that you use men, women, and children that aren't gifted in speech. 
Thank you, Lord, that you, you will just work through instruments that are empty, looking to Jesus alone and letting the Holy Spirit flow through us. God, I pray, empower us together and let no one look down on any part of the body, any part of service that we all are working together for this great end. And God, I pray that the nations would call upon Jesus Christ and that they would hear about the faith of Southside Bible Church around the world like the church at Rome. God, I pray that they would hear about it around the corner. I pray they'd hear about it in my neighborhood in Castle Rock. God, I pray, awaken us. Don't let us stare at such beauty and let it be the best kept secret. God, let it be told. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.